Hi, everyone. Today we have Tara Vanderdusen, the New Mexico milkmaid. She's on today with me to talk about um, sustainability on dairy farms. Uh, Tara and I were talking right before I started recording the conversation, and we are both University of Arizona alumni, so bear down. <laughs> yeah, bear down. Um, thank you for being here today, Tara. Tara is an environmental scientist. She's been one for nine years. She works with a lot of different agricultural people to help them on consulting on their farms, federal regulatory compliance, water conservation, anything to do with sustainability. Um, and she's also an ambassador and a, for the agricultural dairy industry at a national and international level at places like the United Nations and FAO. And I wanted to have her on. She's big on Instagram and, and Facebook. You can follow her at the New Mexico Milkmaid. And uh, she's just a fabulous mom of two. Uh, she farms, she dairy farms in New Mexico, Eastern New Mexico with her husband. And uh, we'll find out more about that in a little bit. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk with you today. So Tara, what does an environmental scientist do? Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, I've been working as an environmental scientist for the last nine years. I work for a third party company that's actually based at our state capital in Santa Fe. And we work on all sorts of different projects, but my primary role is to work on dairies in New Mexico. And basically I assist them with getting their permitting through the state or if they need permitting through federal agencies like EPA. Um, I help with their water management. So in New Mexico with uh, limited water, we're really regulated on how much water we use on our dairies and water rights. And so I assist clients with that kind of thing. Uh, as well as their nutrient management. So keeping track of the nutrients in the lagoon and keeping track of what's being applied out onto the fields, as well as soil sampling, water sampling, all that kind of different things that goes into uh, the compliance, the regulatory compliance on a dairy farm. So is that, are those items that your clients or your dairy farmers are supposed to be doing and they have to do in order to comply, in order to, that, that the state or the federal government regulates, or are these optional things? Is it a little of both? It's a little bit of both. Most of it is requirements. So in order for New Mexico, for example, every state's a little different, but you have to have a permit to uh, have a dairy farm. And in New Mexico, that permit regulates exactly how much water you can use in your barn. And so we meter water going into the barn, we meter water going out of the barn, and we meter water going out onto the field. That's like the basics of it. We just track the water as it moves. And then we sample the water also throughout those different phases. So we sample the groundwater to track um, how the groundwater is doing, if there's any contamination. Uh, and then we track the water in the lagoon. We sample it to see what nutrients are available. And then finally, we sample the soil out in the field to see you know, how much of those nutrients we actually need to apply to the crop. And so, yeah, I kind of feel like I just follow the water as it moves through the dairy. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So tell us what, can you tell, um, you know, I'm a dairy farmer, so I, I probably know a lot, but I want to talk about like, what does, what does sustainability look like on a dairy farm? You've been doing this uh, seven weeks prior to Earth Day, um, which is why I was, I got the idea to have you on and talk about like, what, what are the misconceptions about sustainability on dairy farms? Yeah, so leading up to Earth Day, I've been sharing a lot of facts about dairy sustainability that I hope people don't know. And I think for the most part, it has genuinely surprised people. And there's so much to it. I feel like I could probably make this like a year long, like every month focus on like a different area. Um, this week, I've been focusing really on like what cows eat. Uh, cows are, I mean, as nutritionists, you know that cows are incredible with what they can eat and like upcycle. We call them upcyclers. So they take inedible foods that humans can't eat or just wasted byproducts and are able to turn it into a great um, food source for humans. And so I've been talking about just all of those different areas where we can get food. Uh, a lot of it is just like specific to your local area or region, um, but you can feed cows like in our area, we have a ton of cotton and every single cotton plant has a seed and they, wait, they pull the seed out to make cotton and that seed would normally be wasted but the cows are able to eat it and it's a really great source of protein. So that was like one of the facts I shared. Uh, cows also can eat dried distiller grain, which comes from brewery or like cereal waste, like any kind of grain, um, they can eat that. Um, I also shared, people loved that I shared about tires. We repurpose tires on our dairy to hold down our silage piles. The silage pile basically acts like a giant Ziploc bag for cow feed. And so it has to be sealed up and the tires really hold that down 
and um, keep it sealed. And that post like went kind of crazy that people just loved learning that, that, you know, just instead of ending up in a landfill, we have a purpose for tires. Um, I think dairy farmers have a purpose for like almost anything on their farms. Uh, and so nothing goes to waste. Very little waste even leaves the dairy farm. Um, most of everything is recycled, repurposed, reused. And so I've just been sharing kind of different facts like that. Uh, I feel like afterwards, I kind of want to talk more about water recycling. I know I've talked about it before on my page, but that's like a whole nother like beast of uh, ways that dairy farmers are recycling gallons of water on their dairy farm. Yeah, and I think it's important. I think sometimes as dairy farmers, we get scared to talk about like different regions because we know what's pertinent to New Mexico. I know what's pertinent to Arizona. But I mean, all these different regions have so much um, different byproducts that can be fed that humans can't, right? Because they're higher in fiber and would just not be digestible. And because of that cow's four, four part compartment stomach, it can actually break down all these things and, and make it useful. You know, I know here in Arizona, we have a lot, we use a lot of almond holes, which everybody eats the almonds, but the holes have to get used yeah. somewhere. And then so we, we get to redirect all that landfill direction of food that would normally be going to the landfill back to the dairy, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's like millions and millions of tons everywhere across every dairy in the United States that's reusing this. And you mentioned that it's different for every region. And that's one of the cool things. I have a ton of far farmers that follow me and they all shared about what they feed in their local area. Farmers in Florida are going to feed like citrus waste. Yeah. Farmers, I know farmers that are close to like um, a fruit and vegetable processing plant and they get all the leftover scraps, like the stem on things or the peel. Well, cows can eat those things that we can't. And so I thought it was really cool to scroll through the comments. And I, I think I'm going to do a wrap up post about all the different foods across the country, almond holes. In Southern New Mexico, we feed green chili leftovers to our <laughs> cows. Like it, it's whatever you have in your area, yeah. you know, and, and I think the theme this week for me was really about collaboration collaborations between farmers and businesses and reducing waste like even grocery store waste you can feed grocery store waste to cows bakery waste I mean the list goes on and on about all the different things that otherwise would just go in the trash that cows are able to eat I think it's 80 percent of a cow's diet is inedible human food that like you know just things that we wouldn't be able to eat. We wouldn't be able to digest. So we're definitely not competing with humans for food. <laughs> so I mean, the cows aren't. I say we because I sometimes relate more to the ladies than I do humans. So. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's always funny when I talk about the cows because I feel like I'm almost one of them. <laughs> one, one with, one with the dairy. Yeah, and you know what's crazy is right now we need to be doing a lot of that collaboration because of all the food waste that we're seeing with our, our fellow farmers, you know, what in Florida, I think I saw the onion farmer who showed all everything on TikTok of all the waste that he had um, and being able to find a home for that food. So it's not wasted with restaurants being closed and food service being, you know, almost nothing. Um, and I think, you know, obviously dumping of milk even has, has been a huge issue across the United States and trying to get people to understand that it's not just something you can, fill up a jug at the dairy and bring home. It's got to go through a, a little processing to make sure it's health, it's safe. And so um, I just, I, go ahead. I think there is going to be more collaborations. Like it is, a, I mean, I hate seeing that wasted food. I mean, we waste food every single day in this country before COVID-19, you know, before COVID-19 hit, we waste, I think 40% of our food ends up being wasted. Um, and, you know, when we can make those collaborations connections, like I, d I saw someone that shared that bad carrots, carrots that aren't pretty enough, they go to cows. Um, but I, I do think that we will see hopefully more connections in the days and weeks to come of farmers that don't have a place for their market do team up with cattle and hogs and dairies to feed that waste. I know even on our dairy, um, you know, instead of, instead of just wasting the milk, we're trying to be really resourceful with it. So we are feeding it to our calves. We're offering calves more milk than we usually do. Um, just trying to use up every last drop that we really can, even feeding it back to our adult cows um, as, you know, a liquid component um, and working with our nutritionist on that to make sure that the cows are still getting absolute optimal diet while trying to waste as little 
of our milk as possible. But like you said, I mean, it's not as simple as just like, oh, bring your gallon to the dairy and fill up. It's a raw product. And I know like online, I've seen a ton of like, I can't believe you guys don't just donate it. That's so greedy of you. And it's like, if I could donate it, I would in a heartbeat. Um, I feel passionately about hunger in this country and now more than ever before. It's just not that simple. Uh, it's huge tankers of milk that have to be processed, packaged, then distributed. That doesn't happen overnight either. Uh, I think, again, we are working towards some more donations of milk, but it, it takes a little bit of time. I mean, we're all kind of, you know, got a slap in the face with uh, the coronavirus and we're just not prepared for it. Yeah, nobody, nobody definitely was, especially, you know, and everybody's hurting, every industry, every retailer, every food service, every restaurant, every small business owner. I mean, it's affecting everybody in a very, very large way. Um, yeah. And that's where these collaborations can help us through moving things and making sure at least as humans, we, we get the food that we need, right? Absolutely. So what are some, what are like, I guess when I think about Earth Day and I think about, you know, our part in it as dairy farmers or, or dairy uh, industry people, what, what is the big message that you try to convey to people online with your huge following? Definitely the to not believe everything they read on the internet or see like offhand. Um, I think that sustainability is much more complicated than it's usually portrayed on the internet. Uh, it is, you know, it takes all these systems working together to really be sustainable. I mean, sustainability is not just about the earth. It has to be economically sustainable as well. It has to be, um, you know, with food, it has to be cultural. Like food is very cultural to us. It's very personal to us. So it, I think food sustainability, agriculture sustainability is a really complicated topic that, uh, you know, on the face value, you could say, like, you know, we all see the going green, like don't eat meat. And it, it's just not that simple. We just talked about all of the millions of tons of things that would be wasted if cattle weren't eating it. Um, and so like those factors, I don't think always come into play. I also think about like from a soil health perspective that cow manure is such a valuable resource for improving your soil health and improving your organic matter. Mm -hmm. The more organic matter you have, the more water you can hold in your soils, the more carbon that's sequestered. And so, you know, all of those processes are, are so far beyond just like a, what you're eating and like B, what the carbon footprint is, right? Like it's, it's just a huge system. If you take one piece out, I think one of the things we've learned throughout history is anytime we take one piece of something out, it changes the entire system beyond what we could have ever expected. And I think the same with animal agriculture. Animal agriculture has been a part of our history for thousands of years, a part of our diets, a part of how we evolved to where we're at. Um, how our land evolved. It, I mean, it's just, it's a vital part, I think, of our environment. Uh, and it's, it's complicated to convey all those things in like a caption on Instagram or even a blog. Yeah. Uh, and you can get really deep in the science and that doesn't always like do any good. Uh, I think people make decisions more emotionally based. And so when I share, I try to just share just day-to-day -day life more, my experiences. That's what I always say is I'm not trying to educate anyone. I'm just showing you my experiences of what happens on my dairy farm and let people make their own decisions after they see what dairy farms are doing. I love that. Uh, that's, that's, that's a really great point, you know, about w what perspectives we have and things like that. One, uh, so what are, what are some on-farm things? Because I think that the other misconception is, you know, people think we, we waste a lot of water, we don't reuse things, um, you know, we're, uh, we're taking too much out of the soil and all, the, all these different concepts as, as farmers. So what, what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so in the last 75 years, actually, we've reduced our water use on dairies by 65%. And it's not by huge, big changes. It's small little things that can have a really big impact, I think, on your dairy farm. Um, I always talk about that in our barn, we have nozzles on all of our hoses and timers. And we make sure there's not leaking. That's actually one of my jobs is to go in the milk parlor, make sure no hoses are leaking, no faucets are leaking. Just like at your house, if your kitchen sink is leaking, your water bill is going to go through the roof really quickly, even if it's a small li little leak. And on a dairy, you know, it's that much bigger that you could be wasting that much more water. And so simply just checking like management practices in the barn, uh, making sure that the um, staff and the employees understand, you know, that 
by sitting there hosing for too long, you're wasting X amount of gallons of water. And so just kind of training even with why we're doing what we're doing. And then dairy farmers can use a single gallon of water up to five times, which I think is really cool. Uh, for us in New Mexico, uh, we use groundwater. And so we use the water the first time to cool the milk because groundwater is at about 55 degrees, whereas the cow milk is about 102. Uh, and so we'll take kind of the edge off the milk with the groundwater. Then we'll use that same water to clean the equipment. We'll use that water to clean out the concrete on the barn and then we'll flush out the back of the barn. Uh, and then ultimately we store all that water in our lagoon systems. And then we apply that water finally out onto our crops. And by that point, it's collected a lot of manure along the way and ends up being a really valuable nutrient rich source. Like it's, it's more than just water at that point. Um, it can be, you know, a, a natural fertilizer for our crops. Um, and so that whole water flow process, I think, is really cool for people to see and really understand uh, how, you know, in New Mexico, Arizona is the same, like water can be one of our limiting resources. Yeah. And so really maximizing every single gallon of water is important for every aspect of the farm. So tell us a little bit about your dairy. Yeah, so, uh, well, I grew up on a dairy farm actually just down the road from my husband's family farm. And then after we got married, I moved on to his family farm. And uh, my husband is one of six boys. And five of those six work on the dairy with it with my father in law. Uh, and so it's a very, you know, collaborative effort between all the brothers, they each kind of have their own individual focus of what they do, which I think is really great and highlights their strengths as individuals on the dairy, you can really see where they shine. Um, my husband loves cows, it's very obvious, like he loves working hands on with the cows. Uh, one of my brother-in-laws is a fantastic mechanic, like he will fix it. Uh, another brother-in-law is great with ordering the feed, watching the market, keeping up on more of the business side of things. And so I love seeing them, their father, like foster each of those talents within them in a unique way on the dairy. You know, dairy farming, I think a lot of people think of it as just milking a cow and it's so much beyond that. Uh, There's so many unique roles, like even my job probably didn't exist on a dairy farm a few decades ago. And now I, I love it. And I don't necessarily work with the cows, but I still consider myself a dairy farmer because that's my job on the dairy. Uh, and so I think that's a really cool thing about dairy farming is you can definitely find something you love on it. That's awesome. I love, I love to hear the family dynamics of like brothers working together in different departments. Cause I think, you know, that's another misconception is like 97, 98% of dairy farms in the United States are all family owned and operated at yeah. some degree and some level. So. It's yeah, really absolutely. Cool Even um, I mean, we're a larger farm. New Mexico is known for its large herd size. I think our average herd size is 2,200. Mm -hmm. um, that is just a standard size dairy in New Mexico, but it doesn't change anything. Actually, I think in New Mexico, it's 99% of all dairy farms are family owned and operated. Um, and so it, yeah, no matter your size, uh, dairies across the country are, you know, owned by family farmers. Yeah, I know it's the same for Arizona. I think 100% of our dairy farms are yeah. <laughs> owned, uh, you know, and, and we have a couple, you know, places that are corporate, you know, kind of like Shamrock, but Shamrock still owns, it's still family owned and it's, they still own the dairy and, um, you know, and that, that's still family owned. And so we have that, yeah. that going too. Uh, so how many cows do you guys milk? So uh, on the farm that I live on, actually, we milk about 2000. So we're right there with that average herd size. That's good. Yeah, that's cool. I think Arizona, the average is about 2,500 in a herd. And I think people have a hard time understanding as you move west, the dairies get larger. Yeah. Um, and you want to talk about a little bit why, why that is? I mean, so I'm sure there's a million reasons, but I know that like our families came to New Mexico because there was a real, multiple reasons. One, there was a really strong farming community here, but they didn't have a great market for their crops. And so there was a real opportunity, again, that collaboration between farmers that they needed a market. Dairy farmers are a great market for, you know, corn, silage, um, wheat, all those different things um, throughout the entire year. And so there was that opportunity and then uh, land large wide open spaces in the West uh, where you can, you know, available land uh, mm -hmm. as well as our great climate, sunny days, cows typically like a fairly mild climate. And I think that the West tends to offer that the Southwest does. Um, and so we don't, we're open lot here in New Mexico. So we don't have like our cows are outdoors 
all year round. They have shades, wind breaks, those kind of things, but they're not in a barn. And so there, I think there's a lot of factors that go into play that allowed earlier on for larger herd sizes. I think we're seeing it now more across the country as technology improves and, you know, different innovations. But um, I think those open lots were like a huge part of um, larger farms. So what, what else do you have up your sleeve this, this, the rest of the week for Earth Day? Can you give us any, any insight? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely will have like a wrap up post, I guess, tomorrow. Today, I ha I'm, try I'm still not exactly sure what I'm sharing for the last two days, I guess. There's, like I said, so many things, like so many different directions you could go with it of what's being recycled. I'm trying to focus on really that reducing waste and the collaborative effort. So um, I, I, it's still a little up in the air. Is that terrible? It's already like 10 o'clock on yeah, the day. Really normal. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm not one of those people that plans out my post too far in advance. Um, but something like this, you know, I have an idea and I kind of just try to run with it each day. Um, but I definitely want to continue it. There was a ton. I've gotten great responses on this like week long series. And so I think I'll start doing more week long series about like different focused areas. Like I said, like maybe water next and really dive into the water um, part of it. So stay tuned. There's, there's going to be fun stuff. I always find it hard to know what to share, like what would be interesting because this is everyday life for you and, and for me. And it's kind of like, well, what's interesting? So it's, it's hard to, to, for me to gauge like what people are interested in and what they're not. But I think obviously, I think the other thing about it is sustainability is, is such a hot word. It's such a, a popular word right now. And it, it, like I know when I talked to a lot of my clients about sustainability in the beginning before it became all this, when it was just first kind of coming out, they're like, what, what does that mean? You know, it's like going green or what is, what, what exactly are we talking about here? And then when you explain, you know, it's water conservation, it's taking care of the land. And they looked at me like, well, duh, we've been doing that for years. Yeah, <laughs> I <so> agree. <laughs> so it's really interesting to bring that up now and have that, right? I'm sure you have the same outlook and, it, and it's, that's what I mean. Like it's everyday life for us. So we don't even think of it as sustainability. It's just yeah, my husband always says that. He's always like, I don't know what you're going to share about. Like, I asked him the other day, someone asked us, what are some challenges dairy farmers face? And I'm like, I don't know. Everything goes along. I mean, it's fine. It's just like normal life. And I was like, you got home like at eight o'clock, like two nights ago, because things were going wrong. Like, what challenges did you face? And he was like, yeah, but it was fine. I mean, it's just, that's just what happens on a dairy. And I think kind of like rethinking the way, you know, processing how you think about things. Um, and I think getting feedback online is helpful because then you're like, oh, that that is something that people didn't know. That is interesting to people. Like, I should share more about that. Like the tires thing. Like I said, I would have had no idea that would have been such a big post. And so I do think you have to think, like I always tell Daniel, like think about it as if you didn't live on a farm, like what would you <laughs> out of the ordinary. And um, so I think you do have to kind of like reset yourself a little bit because it is just everyday life for us. It doesn't, it, it doesn't normally phase us that much, I don't think. Um, but other people find it really fascinating. Yeah. And I think the other thing too, is like what I, what I, what I struggle with, and I think other dairy farmers too, is this is, you know, you just said Daniel came home at, at 8 p.m. the other night and that's normal, like things happen. Like you can get a call at 2 a.m. and you call at midnight. You know, I, I one of the things that I know I've talked about is we had a, fi a hay fire um, on uh, Father's Day back in like yeah. 2015. And, you know, we spent the whole day Father's Day just trying to move hay and move products so the rest of it doesn't catch on fire. And, and you just, there's, there's, a, there's almost, there's zero pride in it. It's just everyday life. And sometimes when farmers go to post things, they're almost like, Am I, do I sound like a crybaby? Because I'm not being a crybaby. I'm just letting you know this is my life. Like, <laughs> yes. And or like, horrible. am I bragging about this? Like everybody, like Daniel's always like, everybody does that. That's not that cool. Like, I don't want to sound like we're bragging. And I'm like, I'm not, like, no one's bragging about it. Or we're not crying about it. We're not, I'm just sharing what's happening. And yeah. I do that's a weird like it's a it's a very farmer mentality to be like don't don't share too much about our life like I don't need any praise I don't need any like I just I'm good just let me be like on my farm uh and but it, you're like but people want to see about it and so I think it's even harder for the older generation like I yeah. I my dad like follows me but I'm still not totally sure he gets why people would want to follow me you know like yeah. Yeah, my dad is not on any social media. I mean, he's 72. He's not planning on getting on any. He hates when we post him on social media. So it's, it's, it's definitely, 
I try to explain that to people like farmers work on a farm because it's, they can do it by themselves. They don't have to interact with a lot of people and they, they love being accomplished in something that they're doing, right? You see a plant grow, you see, you know, a, a produce come from it that feeds people and you start all over and you plan better for the next year. And it's, it's a, it's repetitive in some sense. Um, and it's very low interaction. And now all of a sudden, you know, people have told our story, the wrong story, and, and, you know, not necessarily all the truths about it. So now we have to go out there and tell our story so that they get the accurate information. And it's, it's so funny to me because I think, you know, a lot of farmers are still like, whoa, I'm so uncomfortable with that. And we are too, like, it's not easy. <laughs> Well, I saw a farmer the other day that was like, we need to not share online. Like the more we share, the more questions people are going to have. And I was like, you are thinking about this backwards. People already have questions. Things were already being shared about farmers. And like you said, there were like tons of misconceptions because no one was there to explain what was happening or, or the story behind it. And so it's like, no, people are already asking questions. We, we need to be there. It's, it's a very different generation than what our grandparents or our parents even grew up in where people, you know, I think about like people during the Great Depression. I highly doubt anyone was asking about where a slice of beef came from or its impact on like the environment. And I think as we grow and develop as a nation, you know, people have more questions about those kind of things and we have to be prepared and out there to answer them. And I, I don't think it's going away anytime soon either. I think people are going to get more and more, you know, involved in where their food is coming from and want to know farmers even more. Yeah, I definitely agree with you 100%. I think that the transparency of where our food's coming from and people wanting to know where it's coming from is very important. And I know, you know, even here, I always get asked, like, where can I buy, you know, your guys's products, you know, and things like that, because people want to support who they know, just like yeah. you support small businesses, just, and we are a small business, all dairies are usually a small business. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we, and we, we band together with our co-ops or, you know, whatever it is in different areas and, and try to take care of each other and, and do that with each other. So I think that's really important that we, we, we do tell our story or else someone else is going to tell it for us. And well, and it's somehow not I feel like we lost our message along the way. I mean, milk is one of the most locally sourced foods there is like most milk only travels like less than a hundred miles from farm to table. And it, like, I love like the local market trend. And I think farmer dairy farmers in particular really missed out on getting like their message out there at the front line saying we're already local. We're already like within just, just so many miles of your community. Um, yeah. And I think that, that we did a disservice to ourselves because now we have to go back and try to re-explain that. Like, no, we are local, even though we're a part of co-ops and we're a global market and all of these things, we're still a really local product to people when you go buy that gallon of milk on the shelf. Yeah. I do think that with the coronavirus going on right now with the pandemic, it has, it will accelerate though, I think this entire discussion about food because food supply is at the forefront of everybody's mind right now. I mean, never before have I walked into a grocery store in my life and seen empty shelves ever. And now I'm going on five weeks of it, like that it's consistently out of products. And not because we have a food shortage, but because of distribution and all sorts of things that are changing. And so I do think that we're at a really unique place to kind of help people understand that process again and really like bring them back to their roots of food and agriculture and connecting with their local farmers. I posted this morning about a USA Today or something, some mainstream media that was sharing that the milkman is coming back. He's, you know, if you have a direct to consumer market uh, for your milk, you're selling out like crazy and that people are loving milk delivered to their door again. I wouldn't like, I don't think you could have convinced me of that three months ago that that was gonna be like a huge trend right now. Yeah. Like that right this second, it was gonna be a trend. And now here we are, you know, like it's kind of crazy, like this progression. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's definitely changing a shift. I know that for me, um, and I, I, let's just touch on it if you don't mind about, you know, people getting out there and farmers, all types of farmers are having a really difficult time. Like we said, just like everybody else um, with not being able to get their yeah. products somewhere to be, to be consumed. Um, but, you know, there's some people out there that are saying that, you know, America should be worried because uh, this could eventually lead to food shortages or food insecurity. Like, what do you, what do you have? What are your comments or your thoughts on that? So I think there will be some challenges. I 
especially as plants close in different areas like large processing plants. I think it, it will bring people back to their local markets. I know a lot of states have already um, changed some regulations that you can buy different meat products straight from a rancher or a farmer or whatever it may be. I do worry like about the food security side of it, um, the biosecurity side. There's a reason we moved to plants that were very like a certain way and held a really high standards. Um, so I don't know, I, it'll be, cu I'm curious to see how this all plays out, but I do think that there is some real opportunity for farmers that maybe, I know a lot of farmers that were already thinking about selling direct to consumers. And I think like now is the time for them because people, I mean, I just, I follow so many farmers online that do do direct to consumer markets and they are selling out. People are feeling more comfortable with their local farmer than their grocery store right now. Uh, you know, they're just not sure what they'll find even at the grocery store. I know even my husband had been asking for something. I can't even think what it was for like the last few weeks. And I was like, you don't seem to get it. They don't have it. Like it's out. Like that's not available at the grocery store right now. And it, it, I just think it was hard for him to wrap his brain around, right? That like the grocery store for a month has been out of something. Um, and like, yeah, if I could have gotten it at a local farmer, I absolutely would have gone and done that. Uh, and so I do think people are doing that more and more. Um, and so I, I'm curious, I think my biggest question is whether it'll bounce back to normal or whether we'll have a new normal within our food supply. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that'll be interesting to see. I think the food food safety obviously is number one on, on like on the list of things. But as far yeah. as food shortages, I don't think we're going to see that in the United States. It would take a few years for that to happen, uh, yeah. <laughs> which That's is good. Like, so. thank I God. Think so there's distribution issues, but there's not necessarily a shortage. I really, and that's what I've been trying to stress on my page is like the American farmer can feed the American people. And yeah. like that, that's huge. That's so important. We need to remember that as we move forward uh, with any discussions around agriculture, that when a pandemic hits, let's remember, like, we need to be able to feed our people ourselves. Um, I mean, maybe we can't get, you know, avocados from warm climates, but for the most part, we need to be able to supply our people with like basic life necessities. I'm sure there's people out there tell, saying avocados are life's necessity for guacamole, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. Like, I'd be sad to live with a world without avocados, to be honest. <laughs> me too. I totally agree. But overall, we need to be able to feed our people within our own borders. And um, even, I mean, you know, we are such a global market. Everything gets exported. We import. But like when something like this hits, it just it makes you so appreciative of everything about your country and your community and everything and that system. Um, and especially the American farmer, you know, that, that, that we're all out there still feeding all of us. I'm, I'm forever grateful, obviously, for, for agriculture and, and our, our farmers, but I do have a new gratitude for teachers. <laughs> I mean, I always appreciated them, but it's a whole different level for me, which you and I have talked about via text already. <laughs> I've always appreciated my teachers because that is yeah. not for me. That was not my calling in life yeah. to watch children. And I, today, actually, it's my daughter's birthday, and she went to the dairy with her dad, which I think will be great. Like, Kids just like need out of the house. And it, yeah. this has been challenging, even for the best easygoing kids. It is just, oh, dear teachers. <laughs> and for parents too, yeah. like, it's, it's, you know, what are you supposed to do? It's just challenging. And, and I think, you know, dairies, we're lucky because we're already isolated. We're already on right. our own. So. <laughs> I just had a conversation with someone yesterday that I was like, I, I mean, we have acres and acres to wander, right? Go ride your bike, go walk to the barn go see what the close-up cows are doing. Any number of things on any go given day. We've adopted a barn cat that gets drugged back and forth between our house and the barn regularly. Like there's endless opportunities. We played in the cotton seed the other day. I cannot imagine being cooped up with two kids in an apartment in New York City. Like my oh, yeah. heart, oh, like yeah. breaks yeah, totally. for those moms and those families and those dads because yeah. It, it would just be almost impossible. Like the East coast with the coldness and the snow still like it's, Oh my gosh. I, I talked to a lot of people here in Arizona that, that have family on the East coast and that's their, they're like, we've decided like they were thinking about moving back and COVID-19 has made them re re decide that they're staying in Arizona because I mean, it's eighties here, you know, we're supposed yeah. to hit a hundred by the end of the week. So it's definitely a, a, a nice time to be outdoors if you can be, at least in our part. So we're very, we're very fortunate. And my brother posted the other day, he said, 
everybody was always complaining that they wanted to be able to work from home and now they're working from home and they're complaining. My brother's single and he's seven years older than me. And I I wrote back to him. I was like, we did not choose to be teachers for a reason. That was not our career choice. Like, (laughs) I've always worked from home. Like that's just my job. Like my company's based in Santa Fe. I live out in Eastern New Mexico. And for the most part, if I need to go out to a dairy, I'd go out to a dairy and I have a home office that I'm in right now. It's lovely. Very fancy. Um, but this is not working from home. Like normally my job, you know, my oldest goes to school. My youngest is home with me sometimes, but one younger kid, like one three-year-old is very different than two kids and one six-year-old, you know, like Mm -hmm. I know the working from home is not normally like this, you know, (laughs) it's a different level. I know it's a different level. Yeah. For me, you know, there's clients that I'm still visiting dairies. I still leave my home to visit dairies. Our office are kind of our headquarters. If they're, you're, if you work in an office, other times in your home working yeah. from home, which we weren't set up for so that's been fun um you know teaching your 72 year old dad how to remote into his work computer and <laughs> it's, it's been fun <laughs> oh my gosh but, no. but yeah visiting dairies is still a normal thing i just i don't have the meetings that i used to we talk more on the phone but i still see all the the ladies when i visit clients dairies i still you know try to go out to mine too and visit there and it's hard because You know, because we're, I don't live on my dairy. So for us, it's a little bit different, but I also want to keep people secure on the dairy. So I don't want to necessarily bring anything over there if I happen to be carrying it. So I stay in my car and I drive around and (laughs) try to help out on, on the forefront of what's needed and not necessarily get too involved because I don't want to uh, possibly bring something. Yeah, I agree. We, um, for field work that I've been doing, I've slowed down way, like way down on my field work. And we're on like a quarter system. So I have, I can complete most of my field work as long as it's done by the end of July. And so I'm kind of like, okay, we have some time. Like we're, I'm good. Like we'll just wait. And, but if I can do something completely on my own, like go sample a well, I don't need to talk to anyone. I don't need to touch anyone. I don't need to look at anyone. Uh, I'll go grab that. But for the most part, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to just avoid because the more, you know, inner contact there is that you worry, you know, you don't want to be a vector. You don't want to be like transporting something you didn't know. Yeah. So this Earth Day takes on a completely different meaning because everybody's kind of on a pause. Yes. And we're able to tell this information that is everyday information to us, but you're just doing such a fabulous job. So I don't want to take, I don't want to, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but thank you for being here and thank you for all that you do on uh, advocacy for, for dairy farmers and agriculture in general. And, And thanks for sharing all your insight with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I hope everyone will tune in uh, to New Mexico Milk Maid, see my last final facts and and enjoy our virtual first ever virtual Earth Day and and maybe have a new appreciation for our Earth that we've never had in the previous years. Yeah, I think we definitely have that. I think everyone's seeing a lot of uh, good things coming from not so much transportation going on and not so much flying going on. So I think it's I think it's going to have a new meeting after after this year. Absolutely. Thank you, Tara. Thank you.